and with Kash Kale, which promises to be fantastic. So warm up, because in the next few minutes, uh, it's going to get warmer. What's the right thing to do? That's a question I've asked thousands of students at Harvard University in my class, Justice. Would it be just to torture the suspect to get the information? Do you think that a person with a bad parent owes them less? Is it all right to steal a drug that your, your child needs to survive? My name is Michael Sandra. And over the years, thousands of students have joined me for an ongoing debate about the moral decisions we face in our everyday lives. This is a course about justice, and we begin with a story. Suppose you're the driver of a trolley car. Nikolai, if you didn't think you'd get caught, would you pay your taxes? I should be able to bid for a baby? I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a market. I mean, in a situation that desperate, you have to do what you have to do to survive. Um, you have to do what you have to do. You have got to do what you got to do. What do you say to Marcus? I've never been in a class like this before. You know, they kind of ask you to, to, to really think and consider the, the moral dilemma. I've never had such a fun class in my life, you know? You turn to the great philosophers of our past for answers. Do you think Bentham is wrong to add up the collective happiness? I don't think he's wrong, but I think Murphy is smarter in any case. Yeah, ben Bentham has to be wrong. If you're right, he's wrong. Okay, he's wrong. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Then we turn to the present to challenge the reasoning behind the moral choices we make every day. I think that what happened in the past has no bearing on what happens today, and I think that discriminating based on race should always be wrong. I just want to say that white people have had their own affirmative action in this country for more than 400 years. It's called nepotism and quid pro quo. So there's nothing wrong with correcting the injustice and discrimination that's been done to black people for 400 years. Even effort depends a lot on fortunate family circumstances for which we can claim no credit. Raise your hand, those of you here who are first in birth order. Too, by the way. <laughs> Mike, I noticed you raised your hand. <laughs> Taking justice was really an eye-opening experience for me. Everything that you've thought of up to that point becomes questioned, becomes challenged. The purpose of sex is one, for its appropriate um, uses, and two, for a unifying purpose between a man and a woman. Your beliefs are your beliefs, and that's fine. But civil union is not marriage within the Catholic Church. What is the right thing to do? People have been arguing for, for millennia, really, uh, and there's still not one definite answer. Um, and, and, well,
place that's, that makes philosophy impossible, but it makes it beautiful at the same time, that we're still debating similar questions. And the reason they're unavoidable, the reason they're inescapable, is that we live some answer to these questions every day. And now, I have the chance to invite you to join us as Harvard opens its classroom to the world. Good afternoon. I'm Maya Jasanoff, professor of history at Harvard, and it's my very great honor and pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to a presentation by Michael Sandel, the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government at Harvard University. Professor Sandel has been teaching political philosophy and writing about the subject at Harvard for more than 30 years. His books include Public Philosophy, Essays on Morality and Politics, The Case Against Perfection, Ethics in the Age of Genetic Engineering, Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do, and most recently, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. His works have been translated into 23 languages. Now, I am, fortunately for me, a colleague of Professor Sandel's at Harvard. What he may not know, and what I will share with you, is that I am also a former student of Professor Sandel's, having taken his wildly popular course, Justice, at Harvard as an undergraduate longer ago than I care to reveal to you today. Now, I am one of at least 15,000 former Harvard undergraduates who have taken Professor Sandel's incredibly stimulating, important course on justice. But the community of students who have learned from Michael Sandel ranges into the millions from the Harvard campus around the world, thanks to his uh, online teaching, his public teaching, he has attained a global audience of millions and has been named one of the most influential intellectuals in China and other parts of the world. This afternoon, I think he's going to give us a wonderful exposure to why his teaching is so uh, 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 important and why the questions that he asks are ones that we should all be asking ourselves, and I hope today to hear some answers from the audience. So with no further ado, please welcome Professor Michael Sandow. Well, first I want to thank my colleague, Maya Jasnoff, for that very generous introduction, including that nice surprise about how about her having been in the class, though she told me just before that she was not among those firstborn who raised their hands. Today we're going to have a discussion, with your help, about philosophy, or at least big philosophical question. Makes a difference to the way we live our collected lives, to the way we organize our social and political life. It's a small question, at least it's easy to state, and not so easy to answer. And that question is, what makes for a just society? And in particular, how should the good things in life be distributed? How should income and opportunities, power, how should those things be distributed? according to what principles? Many principles that philosophers think about and write about may seem very abstract. And so what I suggest is that we begin our conversation with some very concrete examples, examples of questions of justice, questions of justice that arise the time in contemporary life. Maybe I'll try this. Okay. 
All right, so the questions seem abstract, but they arise all the time. And in our public discourse, that we often don't do a very good job of addressing directly big principles and competing ideas about justice. They are present, even if just beneath the surface. So let's begin with a concrete example of distributive justice, about what's fair, about who deserves what and why. Let's take the question of income, income inequality. Let's start out by considering someone who makes a lot of money. Who would be the first person who comes to mind? So, who? Bill Gates? Well, let's think about cricket. How much, how much do you think Sachin Tendulkar makes? What would you guess? A year? Well, what would it be in, in US dollars? I'm not good at converting them very quickly. 20 million, 22 million, 22 million. Now, that's not all from playing cricket. Most of that is from endorsements, <laughs> from endorsements for products. But 22 million a year, that's a lot of money. What does a school teacher in India make in a year? 12,000? In a year. Two, two lakh a year. Is that about right? Two lakh a year. All right, so here's, here's a question. Here's a question of justice. Would you say that Tendulkar deserves to make that much more money than a school teacher. Let's start by just taking a poll, a show of hands. How many, how many say yes? Tendulkar deserves to make that much more money than a school teacher. Raise your hand, those of you who think so. And how many don't think so? The majority don't think so, but there are some who, who do think that he deserves it. So let's begin, let's begin with someone a brave member of the minority who will defend, defend Sachin Tendulkar's making all that money. Why does he deserve to make that, that much money? Who will get us started? Yes. Added to the talent, he spent years and years working on a skill till he's raised it to a hugely expert level. And I think just with that example, he can teach all the school children in India a lot of lessons. And so I would say he is the ultimate school teacher and so he would deserve to earn uh, much more because he's more expert than most other school teachers. Because, wait, 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 keep the microphone for a minute. <laughs> now, if, if, what's your name? Sonia. Sonia. Now, Sonia, if I understood you correctly, you actually made two arguments in favor of his deserving that money. The first argument was he worked very hard to develop his skills as a great batsman. Yes. And the second argument was he's actually like a kind of super teacher. <laughs> he teaches all of those students, but what is, what is Sonia? What does he teach them? He teaches them that hard work can uh, allow you to earn $22 million a year. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, may I ask you one more question before we hear from people who may disagree? Hard work, and I'm sure he did work very hard and trained, but I've tried playing cricket. I, I actually, I love baseball, which is a better form of cricket. No, 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 I'm sorry. I know, I know, I let myself in for that. No, it's the thing that bothers me is when you're running, you have to wear all that stuff, all that gear. I found that very difficult. But if, if I practiced and trained for a lifetime, as hard as Tendulkar, do you think I would be as good a cricketer and 
make $22 million a year? Do, do you think so? Sonia? Perhaps. I can promise you that I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm sure I wouldn't. So, what about that? Well, yes, that is true that he has talent to start with. Right. And um, that is, is something that he's born with and that is no uh, credit to him uh -huh. in the sense that he's not worked on it. Uh, that is a right. fact. Okay, so the argument here is unfolding in an interesting direction already. <laughs> so as Sonia is reflecting on this, she's acknowledging that it isn't only his effort that enables him to be such a great cricketer, it's also that he was born with talent and that having been born with the talent is no credit to him. But Sonia, you've already taken us quite a long way now down a path of philosophical <laughs> reflection. Doesn't that put some pressure on your claim that he deserves all that money? No, well, not really, because at the end of the day, uh, by that logic, um, you would say that everybody deserves exactly the same, regardless of whether they work or what talent they have. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Very good. So Sonia has gotten us going. Thank you for that. Now, who who disagrees with Sonia, and can address her arguments about effort? and what we're born with, who, who has a reply? Who thinks he doesn't deserve all that money and can explain why? Yes, to the side, the young man by, on the, by the side, see if we can pass him the microphone. You don't want to toss it. Go ahead. Uh, I think excelling in career is different from making money. What you're saying is that he has worked very hard and he is trying to, uh, you know, excel in his field. But what, is has to, what this has to do with the money he's earning? He's not earning from the uh, skills he have, but he has. But he's earning from the endorsements, and that is that will cre cre create the inequality which we're talking about here. Okay, but and tell us your name. Shekhar. Shekhar. Yes. Uh, he makes a lot of money from the endorsements. Would it change your mind if the team paid him, if he made it all from the cricket matches? But he, this cannot be possible. I mean, what uh, the team pays or what the, uh, the board pays for, to him for playing cricket is not uh, the equal amount of money which he you know, uh, gains from the endorsements. Right, all right. He makes, actually, I looked it up before I came. Of the 22 million, he makes about four million playing cricket and about 18 million from the endorsements. Let's accept that, let's grant that. Would you say that he deserves the four million? No, no, I, no. Four million, that's all playing cricket. No, it's not about playing cricket. Okay. What happens in India is cricket is considered as the most superior form of sport. Ah. And uh, you know, everyone is agreed to pay much more than what uh, a football player gets, what a hockey player gets. Then. It is, you know, a trend in India, which is not, you know, you, you might be ob obviously, you know, uh, conversant with that, but it is different from other sports as well. If you excel in hockey, you cannot gain four million if you excel in cricket. Okay, so what you're, you, uh, tell me your name again. Shekhar. Shekhar has introduced a new argument here. Sonia introduced one argument that challenged the idea her idea that he deserves it, namely the idea of the accidents of birth playing a part in his skill, in addition to effort. Now we have a further reason to question whether he deserves it that has not to do with the contingency or the accident of his skills and his birth, his good luck, but to do with the fact that he happens to live in a country, in a society, in a time and in a place that puts great value on cricket more so than on football. I think that's actually a wise choice, by the way. <laughs> and so uh, you're suggesting that it isn't really his doing, it's not to his credit 
that he happens to live in a place that prizes the qualities and the talents he happens to have, namely to be a great cricketer, the, the cricket god, they call him, right? Okay, so who has a reply to that? Now, we've heard two objections to the idea that people who make a lot of money can be said to deserve it, one having to do with good luck, the distribution of talents, the other having to do with the good fortune to live in a society that prizes the talents or the abilities or the skills that I happen to have. Yes, what would you say? Yes. Right, right here. All right, and then we'll come to you. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm Belinda from South Africa, and I am a great cricket fan. Okay. And especially of Indian cricket and Tendulkar. For me, okay, he was born with a talent, but he worked hard. Right. And for me, he brings a lot of joy to people. In a country like this, wherever you live, you need joy. So he, in that way, is deserving his money, in one way. He's teaching people, if you've got a talent, use it. Discipline. He's teaching them as well to have a dream. Go for your dream. Life isn't fair, but use what you've got. Life isn't fair? No. But it's use what you've got. Well, he's using what he's got, and he's making a lot of money doing it. But you have a different talent, and you've used it. But you said life is unfair. What it is unfair. Why is it unfair? Well, some have got less talent than others, or some people don't use the talent they've been given. And, uh, but if life is unfair, how can you say at the same time that it's fair for Tendulkar to make 22 million? I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> I can see that. He's brought me hours that. and hours of joy. Joy, he's brought you joy, and therefore you pay him all that money? Why not? What about the, the uh, actresses? Bollywood, Hollywood, yeah? what's the difference? Do they not deserve it? They bring joy to people. So they're they using their talent. They're working hard. Tendulka work more hours than most people work in their lifetime in a, in a year. Okay. <laughs> All right. It sounds, like you, it sounds like this audience is being swayed a little bit, <laughs> listening to the arguments. Now, who... What's your name again? Belinda. Who disagrees with Belinda and has a reply who can address Belinda's arguments? Who disagrees with her? Yes. The woman right here toward the front. Yes. Uh, I disagree with her because she said that uh, Sachin or Hollywood or Bollywood actresses bring joy to people. But I think that even a school teacher also brings a lot of joy to kids. Uh -huh. And if Sachin works hard, so do the teachers. Okay. Oh. All right. What about that, Belinda? No, wait, keep, you keep that. We'll bring another microphone for Belinda. Go ahead, or I'll give you mine. All right, we've got one here. And, we're, and meanwhile, while we're waiting, tell us your name. I'm Vishaka. Vishaka. Yes. All right, what do you, speak directly. Vishaka, I agree with you. Teachers are one of the most important things we have. But we can't, I, I get back to my life is unfair. Unfortunately, some people earn more than others. It shouldn't be about just the money. Sachin does a lot of good with his money. He helps. No, but you haven't quite answered the argument that um, the teacher works hard, maybe harder than Sachin. Maybe. What about that? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with the teachers are important. They're vital. Education's the most important thing. The most important? You mean it's more important even than the joy that you get so, from... Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Education is the most important thing. So why shouldn't teachers be paid as much as cricketers? Why because shouldn't? What I about the suppose? Why shouldn't the best teachers be paid as much as the best cricketers? Take life just time. doesn't work like that. So that's the question that we're looking to answer. Does Sachin deserve that much? No, life is unfair, and he doesn't. Because other people aren't earning it doesn't mean that he doesn't deserve it. He distributes his wealth. Does he distribute the four million? He obviously he does not distribute, uh, you know, as much as he should. Because if he did, then there wouldn't be so much poverty. Mm. Yeah. All right, that's that's a, a tall order. That's a rather that's a rather demanding. 
demanding hope. Um, yes, the man sitting uh, toward the back. Yeah. It's a, it's a question of scale. Such an entity is uh, 100 crore people where a teacher can only teach 100 or 50 or 500 students. So he impacts more people at one time. That's why he deserves his money. And the same applies to the entertainment industry or anybody who can work on a grand scale. Work on a grand scale meaning a lot of people derive joy watching him play. Exactly. Whereas any given school teacher only has an impact on his he, or her teachers. Yes, his audience is limited, whereas Sachin's or a Hollywood actor's audience Or a Bollywood limited. actor. But yeah. would, you, would you agree that what the teacher does, even to a smaller group, is more important than what the Bollywood star does? Uh, as the lady says, life is not fair. So I would agree that the teacher is more important. But now I'm wondering whether people are really defending the fairness <laughs> of the payments or whether people are shrugging their shoulders and saying it's unfair but we can't do anything about it and shouldn't try. No, we should try, but uh, well, the tri trivia seems to be getting more and more important in the country. Okay. Okay, yes. Go ahead. I think we got into the wrong direction about this whole fairness thing. Like, first of all, uh, like uh, with the- Speak directly into the microphone, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. All right. So, like, you know, there's one most important religion in India, and it's like the biggest religion in India, and that is cricket. And undoubtedly, Sachin is the god of it. And having said that, you know, people who follow cricket, they know, like Sachin, the time when he came, Indian cricket was really down, and he was like a 17-year-old boy visiting our Fear State competitor. In the first game, he, he was like a 17-year-old little skinny kid. He, he took a ball right on his chin and kept on playing. And not only that, we all who follow cricket consider Sachin as our brother, our son, our father. So when he makes money, we think we make money because we, we are happy for him. But, uh, but, but I, I tell you another thing. Why it is fair? All right. Because if another cricketer, Rahul Dravid, was playing as good as Sachin, but was not making as much as Sachin from the board, then I would say it, it is unfair. unfair. And like, if you know how much the board makes in billions, and who do they give? First person they need to give to is our cricketers. I mean, they deserve it, right? Okay. We. Who has a reply? Who disagrees? Who, and who has an answer to this argument in favor of the fairness? All right, right down here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, like you said, even if you practice for a million years, you'd never be such a, right? So that's a risk you and didn't you, take. you agree with me about uh, that? <laughs> I don't know. That's okay. what I'm saying. Yeah. You never try it, so you never know. Right. That's a risk he took. He yeah. took the risk of putting in those uh, hours and years into becoming a great cricketer and it worked for him. So uh, the risk paid off. And you well, it's paid it. off, but should it pay off that much? But he took a risk. He took that big a risk, maybe. He dropped out of school. He right. didn't take formal school education. Right. That's a big risk in today's world. Who doesn't right. take formal school education? Right. He put his everything into cricket, so maybe he does deserve, you know. Does a teacher take a risk when he or she studies and goes into a classroom to try to educate students? Not that uh, much. Do you think? No, not that much. You don't do you think, think so? Do you think, I don't think a teacher takes as much of a risk as Sachin took when he dropped out of school okay. in class 10. Okay. All right. We've heard a range of arguments here. Let me first, I want to put a different kind of question of justice to you. But first I want to notice something about the discussions and the debates we've just heard. We began with the question, does Sachin deserve all that money, that much more than a school teacher. And many people have argued vigorously, yes, because his cricket skills bring joy to millions of people, because he worked hard to develop his skills, because he's enormously talented, and because cricket 
it was said, is a kind of national religion. And then we've heard counter arguments to those claims. To the argument about effort, we've considered the fact that his depends not only on effort, but also on talents and skills that he was lucky enough to be born with, but which are no credit to him. They're a matter of good luck. And then we've also heard the argument that it's not his doing that he lives in a society that happens to worship cricketers, to love cricket. That's not his doing. That's not something he deserves. That's not something he can claim credit for. So this raises, these arguments raise a broader question of political philosophy. And that's the question of whether justice, in this case, the distribution of income and wealth, rewards for performing various roles, whether distributive justice is a matter of honoring and rewarding the virtue, the effort, the moral desert of people, or whether it should be governed by other considerations. Considerations other than desert and merit and effort. Now, we've not resolved this question, but the debate has brought out in a powerful way that this is the question we need to think about in order to figure out what a just distribution of income and wealth consists in. I'd like to take another kind of question of distributive justice, this one to do with the distribution of opportunities and offices. The debate about reservations or quotas, or what in the US we call affirmative action. Now, let's begin with the question of university admissions. Let's take the question of whether reservations or quotas for members of scheduled castes should are fair in the case of university admission, let's say admission to uh, the Indian Institutes of Technology, publicly funded institutions. And let's take first a poll, a show of hands. How many favor the use of reservations or quotas in university admissions? Raise your hand. And how many think they're unfair? The majority say that they're unfair in university admissions. Why are they unfair? We'll begin with the critics, and then we'll see uh, if the defenders can answer their arguments. What is the objection? Yes, in the aisle. Yes, stand up. Hi. Uh, First of all, I like to say uh, that reservation, like, it's okay for the generation, right? If a generation gets reservation, and we have seen in India, like, uh, the people who have reservation have seven to eight IAS officers, IAS officers in the family itself. So, after, uh, like, the main purpose of reservation when India got independence was to uplift them, uplift the generation, and then they could take care of it. So, that part is being done. Now, I think, we don't deserve it anymore. The people who have seven IPS officers in their family can themselves take care of it. Like, they don't need to do. All right, so it's a generational matter. And it served its purpose, and it's no longer needed. Um, who, uh, who would like to reply? Go ahead, yes. Stand up, okay. I think about reservation, uh, it's not just unfair. I think it's misplaced when we think about having reservations in universities. Because if we consider the question of reservations came up to uplift certain castes and uh, certain castes and certain sections of the society. Now that won't happen until and unless you provide them basic education. So what the government is not doing is not providing them basic education, but is giving them some sort of quota in the universities, which then continues into post-graduation and then continues into All jobs right. also. Fair so enough. I think it's a little misplaced. Okay, let me let me sharpen that question helps us sharpen on the issue of principle. Now, let's take someone who has an all India rank, an AIR, that determines admission, is that right? Let's say of, uh, of 600, and there's someone else who has uh, an all India rank of 1,000, 
who gets admitted instead. Is this use of quotas or reservations in university admissions an injustice to the person with the higher rank? That's a way of sharpening, because there are these practical objections. But I want to identify the issue of principle. How many think that an injustice is being done to the person of the higher academic rank if he or she is passed over in f on, uh, on the basis of a reservation or quota? And how many think they are not being done an injustice? All right, so the majority still, even when we sharpen it, set aside the, the practical questions of implementation. Consider it's an injustice to the higher ranked applicant. Why is that? Who will explain why it's an injustice to the higher ranked applicant? The woman here on the side. The woman standing just, we're getting, getting your mic. Well, I think it's an injustice because admission to such kind of universities should happen on the basis of merit rather than on the basis of caste. I am not against upliftment. I, what I am saying is, upliftment should not happen at the core of talent, someone's talent. That is what I have to say. All right, and so merit, tell us your name. Mansi. Mansi. Yeah. So the principle of merit should determine university admission. Yes. And the use of reservations is contrary to the principle of merit. Well, when we compare the both, talents, right. talent ranks at a higher level than caste. All right, and why can you tell us why merit should be the sole principle governing university admissions? I would tell that because when you're going to such institute, you are going there for catalyzing, for uh, energizing your talent, your skill. So basically when you're going there, the basic purpose for admission there should be talent only. Not on the basis of caste. You're going on the basis of caste for the upliftment of your skills. That is totally a contradiction. Okay. Um, who, who disagrees? Who disagrees and can tell us why? The, the gentleman uh, toward the back with the glasses. Basically, we all talk of a level playing field. Yes. And is, it, is it really a level playing field to bring in a handicapped player and make him play in the first 11. I think he should have been given, his mother should have been given better nutrition, he should have been given better food, he should have been given better education, so that he could compete on a level playing field. I happen to be from the armed forces, once this whole issue of reservation was brought up in the armed forces, and we put it down saying that we will have a reserved army as long as our enemies also have a reserved army. All right, so this is an argument that says using reservations will, will at, at the end, at the point, at the university admission or at the level of the army may undermine the mission and purpose that those institutions are meant to serve. Is, do I have it right? Okay. Um, and there was someone further back who had his hand up. My great-great-grandfather uh, in 19th century, he went to uh, Banaras to study uh, astrology. My great-grandfather went to Ujjain to study uh, Ayurved. So it is because of generations of my family which have been educated and properly brought up that I am here and I am studying in a good institute. So it's, it's the work of my generation, my forefathers that I am the product right now. Uh, for millions of, for thousands of years, uh, some sections of our societies were discarded a lot. And that is why we need uh, some sort of a, a quid pro quo right now. I mean, an affirmative action to bring them on that level playing field. All right, and, what do you, and what's your name? Aditya. Aditya. Aditya, what do you say to the argument that we just heard that to fail to honor merit, the principle of merit, will make for a less effective army in the case of the military, or will make for a less effective university. The purpose of the university is to promote academic excellence, the uh, argument went. What do you say to that argument? So 
I, I'll say that uh, the purpose of preservation is not just upliftment. It is to bring those people in the in the domain of decision makers. So uh, right now, uh, if we think that someone is getting reservation, it's only for his economic benefit. It's not so. Uh, his whole generation is being uplifted with him, and he is being part of the democratic process. And that is why he can make decisions which are better for his community. And he, I mean, his community is also part of our country, and that's why we need to have those people in the decision making process. Uh. So what you're suggesting, now the argument has shifted a little bit as you've articulated it in an interesting way. We began by discussing merit in university admissions, or for that matter, in recruitment to the military and advancement, as an individual claim for the benefit of members of disadvantaged castes. And many people have defended reservations in the name of helping those who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. But now you've shifted the argument and you've said it isn't just that. It's that these very institutions and the communities in which we live and the country as a whole will be better off if they are made more inclusive, quite apart from whether this or that individual applicant needs or deserves help. Do I have that right? Yes, exactly. All right, so there are two arguments here when people invoke merit. One is an argument about helping an individual, fairness to an individual to overcome disadvantage. The other is an argument about promoting the common good. Yes? All right, now, so we've had really articulated two different rationales what you might call the individual fairness, overcoming disadvantage argument and the argument in the name of the common good for, for using quotas or reservations, who among those who disagree with the fairness of reservations, who has an answer to that argument? Who has an answer to that argument? Yes, the woman sitting in the middle, yeah. Yes. Toward uh, th there's a woman further back who hasn't spoken. Yes, with the, the red sweater. Um, he wants, a, I'm sorry, I forget his name, but the fact that you want to include somebody in the decision-making process of the country, they need to be capable of making that decision. If you haven't climbed up the steps, if you haven't gone through the process of education and learning, then to put you in a position of power would not really benefit anyone. All right, let's, let's also get a microphone to the person who spoke. And what's your, what Vinita. is your? Vinita. Vinita. And your name is? Aditya. Aditya. All right, how do you respond? Stay both of you there, talk to one another, see if you can sort this out, <laughs> see if you can persuade one another. No, the point is, uh, you say that he has to be cap capable of making that decision, but the point is, uh, a large section of society is at his level, and he's a better off, uh, he's a, he, he is a talented person among that section of society. So he needs to be the part of that process which is going to affect some part of his society, no, his I, community. I agree with the fact that he should be up there or people of that uh, group uh, deserve to be in a position of uh, decision making. No, he but also deserves to be there, absolutely, exactly. Absolutely, I agree that he does, but he needs to earn it. The, what, this is, what the system should do is to give him the opportunity, to give him the access to learn and then make his way up that ladder. Not just pick him up from one point and put him at no, the system is not picking up. The, the system is fair. It has already been defined that what kind of process is going to take that he reaches that stage. It is stage. You can debate that whether or not 50% uh, quota or whatever marks the cutoff which is required is adequate or not. But the point is he should be up, he should be up there. Okay. Um, just to deviate a little bit from the decision making in the in policies for the country, if you were to give to somebody in uh, seats for surgery, okay? Now, uh, now that's something which, no. which, 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 which is gonna worry you. No, why should it worry me? Uh, first of all, when he gets admission to some super speciality institute like Ames or what, so he's in that position now to learn and to harbor his skills. But he got that on reservation and I worked equally hard every no, day. No, you didn't work equally hard. It was your, <laughs> it was your forefathers which worked harder. Are there two? 
Right, there, are two, there are two issues here. Aditya is raising two issues. One of them is we shouldn't assume, back to the effort argument that we discussed with Sachin, you shouldn't, we shouldn't assume that our skills, our talents, our achievements are solely our own doing, even those of us who haven't benefited from any reservations or quotas are standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before and given us advantages. That's one, uh, one argument, right? And then the other argument is the argument about an inclusive society being a better society contributing to the common good. But the one part, Aditya, the one part of the argument you haven't really addressed directly is the question of the super specialties, as they're called. Hiring the doctors, let's say, in Ames. Uh, would you, just to sharpen the challenge, would you feel uncomfortable going to a medical specialist, a uh, medical specialist, to perform a complicated surgery on you if you knew that that person were not admitted according to merit as it's defined traditionally, but instead according to a quota. What would you say to that? I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to that part of the challenge. He gets into AIMS based on reservation, but what his progress is within, the, within AIMS, it's without reservation. It's based on his talent, what he's studying over there. And, and so if he's passing the exams with good grades, then why not? Why should now? Why should I not trust him? He's, he's equally as good as other doctors. Okay. What do you say? Um, thing is, getting into aims itself should be merit based. Why should I? Why should I, as a person, have the easy part to get in? Right. I mean, All right. Let me ask you another question because we were talking about in, an inclusive society. Let's take another aspect of the debate about reservations. And let me ask you this question before I put it to the, the group as a whole. You, are you also against, do you think it's also unfair, the women's reservation bill? 33 <laughs> percent? Yes. Uh, I it's, think, it's I, think I think it's unfair because okay. that's, that's not what we need to address, their presence in the parliament. What we need to address is why aren't they getting there? Why are they subjugated at the, at the grouts root level? Okay, so, so you're following, you're extending the principle consistently to reject quotas, reservations for women in, in, to the parliament, to the Lok Sabha. Yeah, you'd be against. Yes. yes. And you think it's unfair? Yes, I think we're not addressing the real issue, that's what we're doing. Okay, let's, let's t all right, so that's a consistent line of argument. Let's take a quick poll. How many think that reservations for women, now we're not talking about caste, for women in elected assemblies, in the Lok Sabha, in local elected assemblies, how many favor such reservations? And the let's say that 33% of all seats should go to women. Yes? How many are opposed? The majority, and that's close, or maybe it's half, are opposed. All right, so we've just now heard one argument against. Who, has an, who disagrees and has an argument in favor, in favor of reservations for women in elected assemblies? Go ahead. If we're starting with the definition of equal opportunity, and if we're saying that men and women are equal in society, then what is the system doing in the first place to define that equality and therefore equal opportunity? Now, if we have started with a not so level playing field, right. and we're trying to work at equality at various levels, and one of them is at this political level, I'm not saying it's the only one, but it's going back even to the education argument, is when do you start supporting the girl child, and therefore you make the argument for making the reservations at an adult woman uh, level, then you're making a significant contribution to actually addressing what equality should be as a lived reality. 
And that's and so you would favor quotas for women in yes. elected assemblies. Yes. Because the playing field is not currently level or equal. No. And so it's to address unequal opportunity. Yes. All right. And uh, t would tell us your name. Tara. Tara. Who disagrees with Tara? Yes. Go ahead. The, w the woman in the, in the white coat, yeah, jacket. Um, what I have is like one point of time we are talking about the and we are creating disparity. is that at one point of time we are talking about equality in the society and on the other hand we are creating disparities in the society on the name of caste and gender and there are various other issues which can be discussed upon and like uh, we should actually think about the th fact that who are actually getting benefited by these reservations. The people who should get the real benefit of these reservations are they actually getting the benefit? We are talking about the opportunities. Are we saying that the opportunities which are existing in our society are the uh, uh, the gender the gender is not getting benefited or the people are not getting benefited because of their castes? The entrance test, which takes place at every level of the examinations or the entrance, does not say that this paper is for this peop uh, this uh, section of society and this paper is for this section of society. What, sh what should be the entrance criteria for getting on the tickets of the political parties to run for office? Sir, it should be completely on merit. Like on merit? Yes. And do you think it is now under the current system? No. It's it's not. If you're talking about the reservation, that if you're giving 33% reservation for a particular gender, right. like, so how are you justifying the equality uh, which you are talking about? All right, so that's what we're trying to get at. Who? Yes, toward the back, the person in the blue, blue sweater. Yes. Person with a scarf, go ahead. Hello, my name is Dhawal, uh, and I'm being an advocate. I can uh, specifically say that, you know, in case of reservations for women, we need to study the history of India, wherein we, what we, we all are, here are uh, uh, more, most of the people here are from uh, urban areas. But if you think of uh, uh, women from the uh, village and all, the thing is that uh, we really need, uh, we really need uh, reservations of women because if women come into the constituencies or come into parliament, they can represent the, the issues of women in a better way rather than a male can do so. See, there is a general article 14 which says that equality for everybody, but on uh, there is an exception on the article 15 which says that in case of uh, the government can pass acts uh, uh, in, in, you know, in against this, but uh, under article 15 which says that uh, discrimination on basis of caste and uh, you know sex is allowed if they are coming from some you know uh, disadvantaged right. society right okay and so it's not but here again we see two two arguments for reservations one of them is to remedy injustice and unequal opportunity and another is the argument that was just made that women members of the assembly will do a better job of representing women. That's not about argument of fairness to the individual office seeker. That's an argument about a broader, more representative democratic system. So we've got two arguments, two different principles that have been articulated defending the idea of a quota for women in representative assemblies. Who disagrees and has a reply to those two arguments? All right, uh, over on the side. We'll pass you the microphone. Um, in 
enforcing a rule does not necessarily mean that it is going to bring about a change. If you are putting women there to help women, that does not mean society is changing and equality for women are being, is being brought about. It just means that you are enforcing it as a rule and would like people to follow it. It's not actually bringing about a real change. And so do you, but do you think it's unfair? You think it might be ineffective in achieving its Yes, goal? I think it's extremely unfair. And why is it unfair? Um, because of this reason only, that it's not going to bring about an actual change. There is going to come a point in time, if you do not take women seriously, like, as an individual in the society, that no matter what their opinions be, they are going to get rejected by the majority of the segment, which is the which, which are the males. In this case, 33% is not an equal division, is it, first of all? Well, so would you favor 50%? I would not, but they are talking about right equality. Now, right now, what, what is the percent in the Lok Sabha? Do you know? Uh, no, I don't. It's about 11%, is that right? Do you think that's fair? No, but the point is that there should not be a reservation for it, right? It okay. should come because you think they deserve a place in Lok Sabha. Or? Okay, the woman just in front. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, well, I think the point I just had to make was the fact that this 11% that is in the Lok Sabha, if this 11% itself is not being heard, where is the chance that someone who has no reservation, has no chance of actually getting in due to the fact that there isn't a quota for women will be heard? If just the 11% of women that are in the Lok Sabha aren't being heard. I think that's the problem with the reservation is that the people who are in it are not, okay, I'm not making any sense. Go ahead, <laughs> you're doing fine. All right, that's, I think I get it. I think I get it, you've done fine. I wanna see, we've discussed two different kinds of reservations, one, for caste in university admissions, the other based on gender for elected assemblies. Is there someone who thinks, now many people were against both and many people were in favor of both. Is there someone who thinks there is a principal difference between these two different kinds of quotas or reservations and someone who can articulate that difference? Okay, yes, go ahead. Uh, good evening, everybody. I would like to make two points here. The basic difference between the two arguments right in the start is at the level of a university for an entrance, at the entrance level, there is a quota, which according to me, it's entirely wrong to discuss on the basis of religion or where you were born. It should be dis actually discussed upon the basis of financial income of a family because I have been from a college where a 78% guy from a quota had a Mercedes and got into the college but having 94% and from a middle class family didn't make it. So that's the case. But coming back to the topic, so but even after getting to, into the college to pass, they have to perform. Right? But in the case of the parliament, if you are uh, admitted to the parliament just on the basis of reservation, you may not make a good parliamentarian. That will defeat the purpose of the institution. Whereas like in the, uh, whereas in the uh, university, you have to pass. By the, for that, you need to perform. So there are no, <laughs> there are no exams in the Lok Sabha. <laughs> yeah. You and, can no, say that. and nobody it fails. You can say that, yes. Everybody passes, but they can be they can be tossed out at the next election. Yeah, but they, uh, but look, what about the five years? They are gone, right? If you don't make a good parliament. So you are, so you are in favor of quotas for universities and against them. I'm not in favor of quotas for university on basis of religion or where you were born on the basis of financial income. Uh, and, ah, well, this is a different argument. So not on the basis of caste, no. but on the basis of, of class. In income. 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 That you'd be in our, favor of. Our constitution was made 63 years back. They just made a list of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. A lot of them people are rich. So they are not from a backward thing. And when it comes on the basis of income, yes, I'm in favor of that. Why? Because humans as a society can only grow if we learn to share, if we learn to include. 
If we don't do that, we are not humans. Right. We cannot go as a society. So here's an argument for the use of quotas or reservations in university admissions but not based on caste, instead based on income. Yes. Helping those who are poor, because there is not, though there is quite a bit of overlap, there is not a perfect overlap between income and caste. Who would like to address that argument? Someone who has defended, I'd like to hear from someone who has defended caste-based reservations. What do you say to the argument that income disadvantaged by income, not caste, should be the basis of reservations for university admission. Who, who disagrees and can say why? And who hasn't spoken yet? Okay, right here. Hi, I'm Manish. Uh, leave caste and wealth alone. Why don't we go to the origin of the problem? The problem originates from the fact that people have that mentality in our country that they uh, deem, the, like they, they uh, see women as uh, a suppressed, uh, suppressed one, and they, they see that they, uh, men uh, feel that they are uh, superior to them. And same is uh, the, uh, in case of caste. So uh, if we try to if we look at what reservations are trying to do, if they are uh, able to do more good than harm, I mean, if they're trying, if they can solve the problem of this mentality of how people think and how they uh, uh, perceive, like uh, how, they, how they view, yeah, people so, from so, uh, from disadvantaged yeah. castes. So, if they are doing good in that case, if they are doing doing good to solve that problem, which is the origin, like why there is inequality in our country, then, then, I, then I think that it's good. But if it's going, doing bad that by giving a 33% quota, people still think that women are weak, that's why they get 33% quota in first place, then it's wrong. So yeah. if you solve the problem, then it's OK. Uh, we, we're talking now about three dimensions of inequality. Income, or, or poverty, caste, and gender. Which of those three sources of inequality do you think is the most serious and in the greatest need of being addressed by reservations? If inequality is a problem, uh, the source doesn't matter, I guess. Like if inequality is a problem, if it, uh, if, if it is due to income or if it, it's due to gender, if it's due to caste, inequality is a problem, you solve that. You don't, like you solve the issue by, uh, I mean, good. All right, all right I, I've got it. All right, I want to try to sum up the discussion. I want to thank everyone who has joined in this discussion of quotas and reservations. What have we seen? What have we learned by listening to the debate? There are certain parallels between the debate we've just had about access to universities or to elective assemblies and the debate we had earlier about a f what it counts as a fair distribution of income and wealth. It begins with this question of who deserves what and why. And those who defend effort in the case of income differences. Effort explains and justifies why some people deserve a lot more money than others. There's a certain parallel between that argument and the argument that invokes merit in university admissions against quotas and reservations. And what those arguments share is this idea that a just society, a just way of distributing opportunities, income, wealth, power, rewards what people deserve, what they merit. Because they've worked hard, because they've studied hard, or practiced cricket hard, and that shows good character. And we should reward and honor that. That's an argument in the name of merit and effort. And against that argument, there are those who say, those who wind up on top haven't worked harder necessarily. Maybe they're standing on the shoulders of generations who have gone before and provided them with the background conditions and opportunities to develop their talents, even to work hard. 
And what about the moral status of having certain talents and skills, regardless of how hard we work or how hard I may practice cricket? Doesn't that challenge the idea that justice is only or mainly about rewarding merit and effort as an individual quality? And finally, there's the question of what do we as a society in any given time and place prize and reward? Yes, being a great cricketer brings joy to millions of people. But that fact that we're crazy about cricket, that's not the doing of the person who derives the benefit from providing that joy. So a second set of arguments has had to do with the common good. Not just fairness, not figuring out what's fair to the individual but asking what will make for a better society, whether it's bringing joy to a lot of people or whether it's making for a more inclusive society where everyone is better represented. Running through all of these arguments have been these two aspects of justice, fairness to the individual and contributing to the common good. We've not resolved the disagreements with which these discussions began here in an hour in Charbagh, in Jaipur. We've not resolved them. But by listening to the arguments that people have made, by trying to press for the principles underlying the opinions and convictions that people have articulated, we've come at least a step closer to understanding, well, to understanding the particular debates and issues about reservations and about income distribution, but also maybe a step closer to understanding how arguments about justice in a pluralist society can proceed. It's a striking feature of democratic societies around the world today that there is widespread frustration and unhappiness with the terms of public discourse. Citizens everywhere are frustrated with the way we argue about politics in public, with the emptiness and the hollowness of the alternatives that political parties and politicians put before us. And I think the reason for that is that we are not really, in our public discourse, addressing big questions, big questions that people care about. We're not really addressing big ethical questions about the meaning of justice, about the common good, about what it means to be a citizen. I think we would do better, we would lift up our public discourse if we engaged, if we developed the habits of engaging more directly with the big ethical questions, the philosophical principles, the visions of justice that underlie the arguments that we have. Not because a morally more robust public discourse would lead to agreement. Learning more about the principles people hold, with whom we disagree, learning more about those principles might lead us to reject them. So the reason for engaging in this more ethically engaged public discourse is not that it will lead necessarily to agreement, but that it will develop good civic habits, habits of listening and learning from one another, and habits of appealing to a kind of public reasoning rather than shouting past one another, which is what too often defines our public discourse today. It will make, I think, the kind of de debates we've been having here today would make for a society as a whole, not only a healthier democracy, but also a society that edged closer to being a just society. Thank you all very much. <laughs> I'm sorry we've had to finish. That certainly isn't fair. There'll be signings going on at this rate for about three days. Thank you all very much indeed. Please, please don't, uh, please allow Michael a space to walk quickly to the signing area. Please walk him through to the signing area. Thank you all. <laughs>